That was a, a record, um, recordly efficient coffee break. Actually, I thought we'd go on for much longer, so we did very well, and Crow Park have done very well by us as well. So, look, you're very welcome back. A uh, very important session now, just before lunchtime. One of the things, I, I, I didn't do all the things I was told to do uh, in, in my first little interaction, so I have to remind you that you all have a sheet, I think, where you can write down questions which can be used then, and there's a 50-minute question and answer session uh, with everybody near the end of the conference, but also the questions that don't get asked or dealt with, uh, we will take away. Uh, so if you identify how we can communicate back to you, we can uh, get a response to your question back to you. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our next speaker, Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan. Siobhan is the Chief Bioethics Officer in the Department of Health. Uh, she's been absolutely instrumental in shaping this uh, legislation, and uh, uh, we look forward to hearing from Siobhan. Good morning, everybody. I'm not sure an introduction which says she was instrumental in shaping the legislation is going to help me here or not, but we'll move on. Um, I did want to say to all of you, I think it's fantastic, I want to thank the HSE for the invitation, but also to everybody, to the huge attendance here today. Um, so the number of people who've taken time out of what I know are very busy schedules to actually come and try and understand this. Patricia gave an unbelievable tour de force through the entire act, um, but I know that it's a huge amount of information to take at one sitting. So I just wanted to assure you that even those of us who were involved in drafting the act would sit there at moments saying, which section? How does it interact? How are we? So it looks extremely complicated, and yes, it is extremely complicated, but I think that once we start to have this dialogue and more of this discussion, I think some of the issues will become clearer. Um, and I think a lot of it is actually what we're doing in practice anyway, or what we'd like to be doing in practice. So I think that there are changes afoot, certainly, but I think, um, I think it's a testament to the number of people who are here today are interested and engaged with this act. So I'm here specifically to talk about part eight of the act, which actually deals with advanced um, healthcare directives. So the rest of the act was drafted by the Department of Justice, obviously with cooperation from the Department of Health. Um, but this particular section of the act, um, this part eight, was drafted by the Department of Health. So basically, an advanced healthcare directive is a statement uh, by a person with capacity outlining their will and preference in relation to the kind of treatment they would or wouldn't like to receive in the future when they've lost capacity. So we have lots of, they're also known um, colloquially as advanced, uh, as advanced statements, living wills. Um, many of you may have already encountered um, service users or patients who have them. So, as Patricia has already said, the legislation was actually enacted on the 30th December, which was when uh, the President actually signed the Act. It hasn't been commenced as yet, and I suppose that's why I would say congratulations to the HSE for taking the initiative to start this dialogue early. Uh, the plan is that the Act would be commenced by the end of this year, so there is a period for us to, um, I suppose, familiarise ourselves and to work through some of the various issues. So AHDs are an important means by which people can exercise autonomy, and that's, I think, integral to a patient-focused um, model of care. Um, it's also important for healthcare providers because it actually provides you with information about what somebody would or wouldn't want. And we all know it can sometimes be difficult when there's four or five different family members each expressing a different view of what maybe their mother or father might have wanted. So I suppose it's, it's, it's a, we think it's also going to be beneficial for those who are interacting with service users and patients because they will have information about what the person actually did want. We recognise that everybody won't want to make an advanced healthcare directive because, as I'll go on to talk about, they are in fact legally binding. So, this is not something that we think 100% of patients will want to do, um, and that's fine. Um, but there will be a substantial number of people who do want to make advanced healthcare directives, and this is what this legislation is actually enabling them to do. We also know that there's a good deal of advanced care planning going on in the system. Um, and we've seen some very good models of that being rolled out right around the country, um, where people are engaging with their healthcare professionals in relation to the kind of treatments they want. Um, and then it's 
rather the healthcare professionals who are drawing up those plans. So we see advanced healthcare directives and advanced care planning as two complementary, um, if you like, uh, instruments that people can now use. So the international context is, as we said, we have the UNCRPD, which is the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disability. And that's very clear that the first principle of that uh, UN convention is that um, it speaks about respect for inherent dignity, individual autonomy, including the freedom to make one's own decisions. And I suppose that's what advanced healthcare directives speak to. Patricia's already covered this, so I'm not going to go into any detail. The Council of Europe recommendation, both in 2009 and 2014, have also stressed the importance of allowing people to make decisions for themselves. So basically, the concept of advanced healthcare directives has quite a long history. Um, it originated, as many of you will probably know, in the United States of America back in the 1960s. Usually it was kind of in tandem with um, uh, lots of technology being introduced, which was actually um, lengthening lives like it had never done before. And so we started to see this kind of technology bring up lots of questions about the kind of way that people wanted to make their healthcare decisions, their end of life care, and ultimately the manner of their own deaths. So we now have all 50 states in the US who have legally binding advanced healthcare directives, and there's also a number of other jurisdictions which you can see there which have introduced um, legally binding advanced healthcare directives. So the background to this is that in March 2013, there was a government decision taken uh, that there should be a new part inserted into the assisted decision-making um, uh, bill, as it was then, and that part was to deal with advanced healthcare directives, which was to meet all of these international obligations and to move towards this more patient-centered care. So in preparation of the provisions, we had a uh, public consultation in 2014, uh, to which we had uh, a total of 67 submissions, a number of submissions from people in the healthcare sector, for which we were really grateful. Um, we actually undertook then um, a sort of very structured analysis of all of the submissions in drafting the legislation to ensure that it was actually workable on the ground. Uh, for healthcare professionals and also for the people who would be making directives. So the Act um, has also made provision for a multidisciplinary group to be established which will make recommendations around a code of practice. I think it's important that the um, Part 8, although it's quite detailed, it's still at a fairly high level in terms of principles. Um, and so what we recognize is that we will need a code of practice to accompany this part of the Act. So uh, the Minister for Health will establish a multidisciplinary group in order to draft that code of practice, and we are currently in the process of trying to establish that group, and we hope that the code of practice will, in fact, be drafted by the end of this year um, in anticipation of the commencement of the legislation. Okay, so the purpose and the guiding principles of Part 8 of the Act. Well, basically, the purpose is to enable people to be treated according to their will and preferences, and to provide, as I say, healthcare professionals with important information about people's treatment choices when they're no longer in a position to be able to have that dialogue themselves. The guiding principle which underpins these provisions is that an adult with capacity can refuse treatment for any reason. And Patricia has already outlined the guiding principles of the Act as a whole in terms of people being allowed to make decisions for themselves, even if we feel that they're unwise decisions, as long as they have capacity to do so. Um, it's important to say that a refusal of treatment in an advanced healthcare directive, even if it results in death, is clearly distinct from permitting euthanasia or assisting suicide. So in fact, the act as it currently stands doesn't in any way exist, uh, doesn't in any way alter the existing legislation on homicide under which um, both euthanasia and assisted suicide would be illegal. So a person can't request in their advanced healthcare directive either euthanasia or assisted suicide. So what are the practicalities then of making an AHD? Well, first and foremost, a person must be an adult, and by that I mean must be over 18 years of age, um, and they must have capacity. Now, as we've already heard, the Act presumes that a person has capacity, and that's already, as we know, been enshrined in the Medical Council guidelines, it's enshrined in the consent policy, that there is a presumption of capacity. Unless there is something in somebody's mind to trigger a doubt 
um, there is a presumption of capacity. So somebody with capacity can make an advanced healthcare directive. And capacity has to be construed in a functional, in, in a, um, in a functional way as set out in section three of the act. So Patricia has also gone through that. So a person, in other words, needs to basically understand the relevant information required to make that decision. They need to be able to retain the information long enough to make the decision and they need to be able to communicate that decision. So given the importance and the potential implication of treatment decisions in an AHD, the Act requires that it must be documented in writing. Um, so just to be clear on that, when we say in writing, it's actually much broader than that. So it's um, obviously in writing uh, also refers to any uh, video or uh, voice recording or speech recognition technologies, for example. So the Act actually doesn't specify a particular format for an AHD, and the reason for that was because we knew that AHDs might be applicable in a number of different circumstances, it didn't seem wise to us to actually have a one-size-fits-all, because the actual um, particular um, context might be quite different. However, we do think it is important that there is some sort of conformity, and I think that's really important for people like yourselves, so that you're not looking at something completely different every single time, but that there are some sort of guidelines. And so the Act does provide that the Minister for Health can make regulations to set out a number of different, if you like, formats that might be applicable, for example, in the context of mental health, or in the context of um, a chronic disease, or um, a brain injury, etc., so that we will have forms that we will hope to develop through the code of practice, um, which people can recognize and be assured that the information is there. Um, provided that the validity and applicability criteria are met, which I'll speak to in a minute, um, there's a very limited amount of information that, as I say, needs to actually be in the Advanced Healthcare Directive as prescribed here in the legislation. And effectively, that is the name, address, and date of birth of the person themselves who's making it. Um, also, if they have, and I'll come to that, if they've nominated um, a designated representative, healthcare representative, their name, address, date of birth, and then it needs to be witnessed um, by two different witnesses, one of whom shouldn't be a member of the person's family to ensure that there's no, if you like, um, coercion going on. A person's values, beliefs and preferences can also change over time and we're all very aware of that and certainly something that you felt would not be for you perhaps at the beginning of a chronic disease, you might take a slightly different view as you've uh, come some way through it or if you've had for example in the sphere of mental health a particular experience, you know, you will, life kind of teaches you that by experience we often change our preferences. So to that extent the provisions allow for a person to alter or revoke um, their advanced healthcare directives at any time, provided they have capacity to do so, and that they document that in writing. Because obviously what we don't want is a whole series of advanced healthcare directives being presented, one saying one thing, one saying another, and nobody being able to make sense of any of them. Okay, a refusal of treatment in an advanced healthcare directive, and we recognize that for the most part, um, in terms of healthcare, what people are generally doing in an advanced healthcare directive is usually refusing treatment. Um, it will have the same authority as a refusal if it were made contemporaneously. So if you would have somebody sitting in front of you who refused to give consent, it is the same, it has exactly the same legal weight as it would if the person had made it in their advanced healthcare directive. For the refusal to be considered legally binding, however, they have to fulfill a number of criteria. So the conditions that have to be met is that first of all, that the person now has to lack capacity, because obviously if they have capacity and they're sitting in front of you, you should have that discussion with them. But if they now lack capacity, their advanced healthcare directive comes into play, comes into action. Um, the treatment being refused has to be clearly identified. And the context in which the treatment that's being refused, that also needs to be outlined. So there does require, and this is the onus, if you like, on the directive maker, on the person who's making the directive, there does need to be a, a level of specificity here. Because otherwise, for people like yourselves who are reading it, it can be difficult to interpret. 
So again, the treatment that's being refused has to be clearly identified and the specific situation. So for example, you can think of examples like antibiotics and so use of antibiotics where, you know, on the one hand, not for lengthening life, but for comfort, somebody might have a different view in both those situations. So context, context does matter. Um, part eight of the act also allows in an advanced healthcare directive for the person to actually make treatment requests. Now, the difference here is that obviously, for obvious reasons, I think everybody in the room will understand, a treatment request won't be legally binding, right? Um, so they can tell you it's part of, if you like, the will and preferences, I would like. So I mean, many of us, for example, would say, well, I would like to die at home, or I would like to forego this, this, and this. In terms of, I would like to have this, this, and this new drug. That's not always going to be possible, nor appropriate, and in many cases might actually be futile or against, if you like, um, not the best interests, I don't want to stray into best interests, but uh, in terms of benefiting that particular patient. So I think in that case, it's to be aware that you can make a treatment request in your advanced healthcare directive. And there is an obligation on the healthcare professional to actually say why that is not being met. So if there is a treatment request, the healthcare professional actually has to put into the chart or note in the person's notes why it is that that hasn't been met. And they can also, they're also obliged if the person has a designated healthcare representative to inform, inform that person of the reason why that treatment request wasn't met or upheld. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the validity and um, applicability criteria. So it's important that um, an advanced healthcare directive, for it to be binding, legally binding, it needs to meet a number of validity and applicability criteria. So an advanced healthcare directive would not be considered uh, valid if it had not been made voluntarily. And in fact, uh, the bill um, actually, or the, the act, um, been at it so long now, I keep calling it the bill, but anyway, the act, um, uh, actually under the legislation, there are clear penalties, including fines and imprisonments up to five years, term of imprisonment, um, if it's found that somebody has in fact coerced or through fraudulent methods actually made somebody either make an advanced healthcare directive, alter it, or in fact revoke it. Um, an AHD would also be considered um, um, invalid if there was evidence that the person still had, um, uh, when they still had capacity, that they did anything that was really clearly inconsistent with the terms of their AHD. So by that I mean if you take an example where, for example, they've made their AHD three years ago, they've said, for example, I absolutely do not wish to have this treatment, that treatment, the other treatment. They've subsequently gone into hospital and while they were competent, said a whole series of things like, I would like this and I definitely want that and so on and so on. And then they come in on a subsequent occasion and somebody says, well, hang on, this all looks really strange in their chart. So it depends on when that was dated, whether they had updated it, etc. So they need to be consistent with what's actually in their AHD. Um, an AHD can't come into force if the person who made it has capacity to refuse the treatment or to consent to treatment. So that's really important. So the AHD has absolutely no status whatsoever until that person loses their capacity. And then their AHD, or indeed their designated representative, actually comes into force and they then step in to, to, to make clear what the person's will and preferences were. The other reason um, an AHD would not be applicable if, is if the treatment in question or the circumstances that arise were not materially the same as those specified in an AHD. And that's, I did talk about the fact that, you know, the onus is on the person who's making the directive to be quite specific about the kind of treatment they don't wish to have and the context in which that arises. So I think we will have to give lots of information and help to people who want to make AHDs. And likewise, I think in the code of practice, we will have to be very clear about explaining um, to healthcare professionals about what we consider to be materially the same, which I know is really difficult, but this is what um, drafters make you write, even though you want to be, I suppose, more specific. Um, but the code of practice will help us work through some of those issues. Okay, so if a person in their advanced healthcare directive decides that they want to say no to any life-sustaining treatment, um, that would not be enforceable unless they make a specific statement to that effect. And they need to make the statement to say, I, I'm refusing this, 
I understand that means that there is a risk to my life. life. So they need to be clear that what they're refusing is actually um, um, could potentially put their lives at risk. A person cannot also refuse basic care in their advanced healthcare directive. And I suppose um, how we're defining basic care in the, um, in the Act is warmth, shelter, oral nutrition, um, hygiene measures. Um, but basic care would not include artificial nutrition and hydration, which the courts have already um, come to a conclusion that that, in fact, represents treatment and not basic care. And we'll go into some depth, I think the plan is, to, to work through certain scenarios in terms of a code of practice in relation to that issue. Um, an advanced healthcare directive really does represent a very clear indication of a person's will and preferences regarding their treatment. Um, if they've gone to the, the bother, if you like, of actually making an advanced healthcare directive and they've sat down and thought about these specific treatments they don't want in the specific situations and they've outlined all of that, I think it's really important that any ambiguity that arises in relation to a treatment that they've said they don't want or a particular kind in which they wouldn't wish to, wouldn't wish to have it, um, if there is any ambiguity on your part as a healthcare professional when you look at that, there needs to be a really high threshold of doubt before you would disregard a treatment refusal. Because a treatment refusal under this legislation is in fact binding. So because it is the person's most authoritative statement of their will and preferences, of course there may be situations, and I'll talk about those, where it isn't clear where the person hasn't drafted it correctly or whatever, those things will arise. Um, but it's to be really clear here that there needs to be a really high level of doubt on your behalf that you would actually challenge it and say, no, not doing that. Where ambiguity does arise, there are a number of steps that are outlined under the legislation. Um, the first being that if the person has designated a healthcare representative in their advanced healthcare directive, and I'll come to that, but if they have named somebody that they wish you to have a discussion with, then in the first instance, if there is ambiguity, you would go to that person and have a discussion with them. If there isn't such a person who is designated under the advanced healthcare directive, you should go and speak to the person's friends and family in order to establish their will and preferences, if they can be established. And there's also um, a step whereby you would look for a second opinion in terms of asking another colleague to have a look at the Advanced Healthcare Directive and to see whether they would concur or whether they see something that you don't. So there's a whole set of steps. However, if the ambiguity does persist, even after going through those steps, um, then there is, um, in the provisions, they state that, the, um, that it will be resolved through uh, preserving the directive maker's life because it's such serious decisions we're taking. So if there is a real ambiguity, that's what needs to happen. Okay, this was alluded to earlier, advanced healthcare directives and pregnancy. So in line with the state's obligations to vindicate the right to life of the unborn, um, the legislation actually outlines two approaches which have to be adopted when dealing with an advanced healthcare directive in which there's a refusal of treatment and when the person who made it, the directive maker, is actually pregnant, right? In the first instance, where a woman has an advanced healthcare directive, where they have refused a particular treatment, but they haven't mentioned anything about it applying while they are pregnant, and if the healthcare professional is of the view that that refusal of treatment would have a del deleterious effect on the unborn, then there is um, a presumption, if you like, in the legislation that the treatment would be provided or continued. Now, the second scenario is where a woman has made her advanced healthcare directive, has said, I don't want any of the following treatments, and by the way, even if I'm pregnant, I wish this to apply. In that case, there's an automatic referral of that to the High Court, um, and then the High Court will be asked to weigh, if you like, um, to, to, to um, weigh the potential um, impact of the refusal on the unborn, and also the kind of invasiveness and duration of the treatment or the harm that may um, uh, 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 be visited upon the woman in question. Effectively, it doesn't change the law as we have it now. These cases would automatically go to the High Court in any case, so I suppose to a certain extent it tends to maintain the status quo. Advanced healthcare directives and mental health 
Um, basically, we have a single legislative framework encompassing both general and mental health care, but there are two narrow exceptions in the bill, and it's important to mention those. Specific limit of circumstances where a treatment refusal would not be legally binding um, are one where a person's treatment is being regulated under Part 4 of the Mental Health Act. And the reason for that is we need to be consistent in this Act with the Mental Health Act. And as you know, that's undergoing review currently at the moment. So we need to ensure that all of those things line up. So that's going to be re-examined once the Mental Health Act has been reviewed and has been drafted. Um, and then the person is, if the person is subject of a conditional discharge order under the Criminal Law and Sanity Act, so whereby they have to have treatment, that's, that's one of the basis of their um, uh, being given conditional discharges to take their medication. We obviously didn't want them to be able to override that in an advanced healthcare directive, mainly because they probably continue to be detained. Okay, so I want to come to liability considerations because I realise I'm fast running out of time. Um, Importantly, the provisions offer protection to healthcare professionals um, when dealing with advanced healthcare directives. A healthcare professional who acts, and we go back to this expression, a healthcare professional who acts in good faith and complies with the refusal tr of treatment in an AHD um, will not incur any civil or criminal liability. That's the first thing. So if you comply with it, there is no civil or criminal liability. Similar protection from liability exists where a healthcare professional acting in good faith does not comply with it because they reasonably believed that the refusal was not valid or applicable. And we talked about the very high level of doubt that needs to be in somebody's mind and how that needs to be resolved in terms of whether an AHD is valid or applicable or not. If a healthcare professional fails to comply with the treatment refusal because they're unaware of its, exi of its existence, and we had that question earlier on about, well, if I didn't know it existed or the person didn't come in with it or I wasn't able to, wasn't on their chart, what do I do then? Obviously in that situation you're protected from criminal or civil liability because you couldn't comply with something you didn't know. Now if you do know that it's out there but you don't have access to it, likewise you're also um, um, covered until you can actually get a copy of it and then you know what was actually in it. Okay? So I want to say something about the designated healthcare representative. And this is um, a function, if you like, um, where in a person's advanced health care directive, they can actually nominate, now they don't have to do this, but they can nominate a person um, who is a representative, who must be an adult, so like all the other um, interveners, they have to be over 18. Um, and they can be involved in the healthcare decision-making process um, on behalf of the person once they've lost capacity. So they've got a couple of jobs. If you are designated, as a um, designated healthcare representative. Your first and foremost job is to ensure that the, everything that's written in that advanced healthcare directive is actually upheld. But you can, as the directive maker, give this designated healthcare representative other jobs. And they include um, that you can also be the person that the healthcare professional can come to to actually try and resolve ambiguities. So because you've chosen somebody who knows you really well, they can say, well, what would Siobhan have wanted in that particular situation? So that's usually a family member or a very close friend. Um, the second thing is that where there is a decision, you can also empower your designated healthcare representative where you haven't said a particular decision because you're not going to, we all realize, you're not going to cover every eventuality in an advanced healthcare directive. So in that case, I can also empower you, sorry, to take decisions on my behalf. And that's where the person goes and then you can have a consult, the healthcare professional consults with them. Um, and it's important to state, as, as Patricia did, that the director of the Decision Support Service will deal with complaints in relation to how representatives are exercising their powers. So, for example, if I'm the daughter who's uh, been nominated as the designated healthcare representative and my other siblings think that I'm doing a dreadful job or perhaps not um, doing what my mother may have wished or made clear to all of us she wanted to have done, I can be reported to the Decision, uh, to the decision Support Service um, for that reason. I also want to make one other um, uh, point, which I know Patricia also alluded to, which is that um, in the context of an advanced healthcare directive, um, a person under um, who's made a decision in their enduring power of attorney, so you may have your enduring power of attorney and your advanced healthcare directive, um, no decision in enduring power of attorney will be able to overturn something that's in an advanced healthcare directive. So if you like, the advanced healthcare directive will always trump the enduring power of attorney 
simply because you've been the person who's actually chosen this person specifically to make healthcare decisions on your behalf. And finally, um, the role of the courts. So effectively, we see that um, an application can be made to the courts by a person. The legislation doesn't specify who, but it could, for example, be a family member. It could be a healthcare professional. If they believe that the um, AHD is not valid or applicable, or they believe that the designated healthcare representative is not acting in accordance with the powers that have been vested in them by the AHD. And so, kind of, these kind of applications could arise, for example, where there's disagreement or doubt about the validity or applic applicability of an AHD, and any interested party then can go and make an application to the court um, and to have that resolved by the courts. Um, in situations, as Patricia's already covered, where that decision relates to life-sustaining treatment, that if in the case of a disagreement, and I think this is important because we had some um, confusion about this um, at earlier times during the Act, which was, um, we're not saying obviously that every decision relating to um, life-sustaining treatment um, should have to go to the High Court, because obviously that would just be crazy and I mean those kind of decisions are being made every day of the week. We're saying where there is a disagreement that that will be heard by the High Court, which is in fact current practice. Um, and in a situation where something is being, there is a disagreement or doubt about it and it has been referred to the High Court for hearing, in that case a healthcare professional can in fact provide the life-sustaining treatment until there is some, until the ambiguity has been resolved or there is a court order made. So I think I'm a little bit over time, so I apologize for that, but I hope the whistle top uh, tour, and we can come back and do some questions later. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Siobhan. We're gonna take questions at the end of this session for, for all of the speakers. I'd like now to introduce you to Mr. Mervyn Taylor, the manager of SAGE, the support and advocacy services for older people. Thank you, Philip, and thank you for the invitation to speak here. I've got a few minutes, and I just want to give, uh, for those of you who don't read books and are like looking at the pictures instead, this uh, presentation, brief though it is, is for you. Um, I suppose I'm giving a personal perspective, obviously informed by the work of SAGE as a support and advocacy service for older people, but I hope that this perspective will in some way uh, jolt a few ideas. The first thing is to remind people that we are moving from a very simplistic era, 147 years uh, of legisla old legislation, an all or nothing approach. You either had status or you didn't. We're moving from a very, very simplistic background. And the thinking that has been in that legislation has got into our minds, believe it or not. We, we still talk simple language about the way we describe people as not being compass mentors, etc. And we're moving to a much more subtle phase, the piece in the middle where people have capacity but diminished capacity, what decisions, all of these things. It's the subtle pieces in the middle that we now need to be concerned with. In kind of street parlance, the, the old line about oh, Granny, she's lost her marbles, the emphasis now is on how many marbles has she got? Can we give her a few more marbles? And as Siobhan helpfully suggested earlier, what marbles does she need for what decision? So we actually have to change the language of the street, the language of the pub, the language of everyday conversation, because it's that language at the street level at the pub level, at the, the, the coffee shop, that language actually determines how people act. The further uh, point I'd like to make is the background to this, the old legislation and the old view, we're still so concerned, we're particularly concerned in Ireland with the field. Everybody's concerned about the field, the cattle, the house, the car, it's a particularly nice car, and money if you have it. But those are all about valuables. And there's been a massive concern and focus on that, you know, managing people's personal effects. 
But what this is all about really is values. And I'm particularly taken by Mary Lefoy, a judge of the Supreme Court, who stated in the introduction to the quality standards for um, support and advocacy work with older people, she said, too often we see the issues facing older people as related solely to health and social care. In doing so, we can sometimes forget the fundamental importance of values, standards, and the law in determining the well-being of citizens. And today is very much about the law and determining the well-being of citizens. There's also, in a certain sense, nothing new here. For many of you are from the HSC, not all. There's nothing new about this, because it's been a HSC uh, strategy for, since 2008, just about involving people in making decisions about factors that affect their lives. That has been a long stated HSE position. So there's nothing new here. It's simply putting into law what has already been, what is already, if you like, part of your, your, your policy and thinking. So after those observations, to move to some of the challenges. First of all, there's the issue of will and preferences versus best interests. And then there's the issue of risks and preferences. And there's the issue of promoting and incentivizing decision making and development of the decision support service. These, there are many other challenges. This, these are just some of the ones I'd like to touch on. I'm particularly interested in this issue of will and preferences, or as I keep on calling it, wishes and preferences, um, versus best interests. Yes, doctor knows best. And yes, nurse knows best. And yes, your daughter knows best. And yes, the other member of the family who isn't talking to that daughter knows best. Everybody else knows best for you. And that there is a really big cultural shift. And the word I think Patricia used, and it's been used so much about this legislation, is about culture shift. And the way we change culture is how, through behavior, but also through language. So this idea of will and preferences versus best interests it's going to be a long struggle, and the law may change, but it will take us some time to change ourselves and to change others. And part of that issue about the challenge of will and preference relates particularly to the issue of people who uh, want to live at home, continue to live at home, um, or to return home from a care facility which is the desire of the vast majority of older people. Now, many of you will put up your hands and say, oh, this is a very difficult area. But I just remind you of the classic statement. Um, and I hear a chuckle from Justice Baker. The classic statement that you hear objecting to people going home is, and the argument that's used against people or to force people to, to, to think again is, you know, sure, you, if, what if you're found dead on the floor? Well, nobody ever puts the question, what if you're found dead in a nursing home? Eventually, we will all end up in a mortuary at some stage. But the fact of the matter is, it is entirely our wishes and preferences. Now, I understand there are gray areas and there's an issue of neglect. But this is going to be particularly challenging I mean, this, you cannot stand against somebody who consciously says, if I die on the floor, I'd die on the floor. I'd rather die in my own bungalow. I really would. This is going to be challenging. And it is not just going to be a matter for the HSE. It's going to be a matter, a huge challenge for an awful lot of families. Fundamentally, it's also going to be a challenge for the media. When are they going to zip it and to think twice before they rush out onto Joe Duffy or get entertained with every issue about how somebody was neglected and they, somebody should have taken care of somebody. We have to intervene to say, people have rights to speak for themselves. So the other challenge, I think, would be promoting planning for life events. And we're working on a decide.ie project at the moment just to try and think, how can we actually encourage people to plan ahead so that we don't have a lot of the problems that we get when people don't plan ahead. We need to develop ideas 
and to communicate ideas to get people thinking about the future. Who will respect my wishes for the future? Getting people to think, who do you want? Who would you trust with your money, with your life, where you live, with whom you live? Who will choose your carers? And when we've shown those uh, draft designs to people, a huge number of people looking at that picture think, my God, I don't actually, I'm not really sure. And I'm not sure if I want the same person, if I trust the same person with all of those things. So we have a huge amount of work to do to try and get people to think about those issues. The other thing, and it's, uh, you know, the decision making isn't going to happen just because by sheer moral force. Would that it could. Advanced healthcare directors and during power of attorney think ahead, other instruments, let me decide. They're not going to happen just because we will it. There's going to be, there's provision for registers, but how are they going to be accessed? There has to be electronic sharing. Yes, there's new legislation, but, says one minute. There's new legislation, but there is actually an issue about how quickly we can get the technology moving so that we can actually act on people's uh, wishes. Sorry, if I can just go back there one second. The issue that is particularly important here is the incentivizing. So we're going to have to think in terms of GP payments, um, legal aid for, for enduring power of attorney, civic awards, etc. So there's a whole range of incentives need to be actually thought about here. The other point I think we're building, uh, the challenge is building a under the Mental Health or beside the Mental Health Commission, there will be the Decision Support Service. It is a hugely significant public institution that we're building. And it will be a developer of codes of practice. It will be promoting standards, but it is the potential, I don't know, but I raise the question as somebody involved in an advocacy service, if it will in effect become a potential regulator of advocacy services because of the way in which it carries out its work. It may well be helpful in raising the bar about advocacy. The other issue related to that is that we are not yet out of the past. The ghost of the legislation that uh, Dickens wrote about in Bleak House still haunts us and will, be for, will for some time. And the, the, the quote there uh, from the General Solicitor for Minors and Wards of Court, until such time as the legislation is passed, enacted and commenced, the current system must be upheld and complied with. And that brings on the question that I really need to ask here. When we're assessing capacity, are all decisions on wardship now based on the functional test? How can it be that doctors in a hospital can actually say that somebody lacks capacity when the nurses in the same hospital can say that the person has capacity? There is an issue here and we have to address it in relation to the way we're bringing people in through wardship. So the core messages I have for you. First of all, support is available. Apart from this, uh, uh, today's initiative, which is to be, the HSE is to be congratulated on, there are many other initiatives. SAGE is organizing a national program of briefings. My uh, colleagues, Mary Condell, Emer Mean, are organizing those. Some of you will have been at those talk to us about organizing one in your own area and there are events planned around the country. You have new times in front of you and we're working on a video on communication skills and functional test. Give us your feedback. You've all got a copy or most of you will have a copy of new times in front of you. Give us your feedback. Tell us what it is that we haven't made clear, what you need help with, because it's really important that the next edition in a few months time is better again. And important that we develop the skills. If Ronan Woodhouse, at the age of eight, with asthma, with a heart condition and Down syndrome, had to struggle with his mother to communicate with the Minister O'Reilly about the withdrawal of his medical card, and so many people have to struggle to communicate with the system, the health and social care system, how much more important that the health and social care system develop the skills of communication, enhancing capacity, and in relation to the functional test. So it's the law. But there are two key issues. There's resources and there's commencement. Now I'm encouraged by what, some of what I hear today in relation to commencement, but it can't really happen soon enough. 
and the issue of resources is really important. Effectively, we will be almost a year before we're fully up and running. And in that time, there are two real dangers. One is of snipers who want to snipe and say, oh, this isn't going to work, and we don't agree with advanced healthcare directives, and we don't agree with that bit, and that bit doesn't work. And the other is the nostalgics. You know, the people who believe that the hospitals were cleaner when the nuns ran them. <laughs> and that was when the death rate was higher and there were more emergency departments. But nevertheless, there will be people who will pine for the wards of court because it was simpler. That, this period before the, the uh, act is fully commenced and the resources are put in place is going to be a dodgy period and we need to be prepared for that. So thank you to the public servants who consulted, listened and drafted and it, they don't often get enough credit. Huge work went into that. To Patricia who really has kept faith and focus and to the HSE Quality Improvement Division who've organised this event in a timely fashion. Thank you indeed. Thank you very much, Mervyn. Some, there was some subtle product placement in your uh, talk there. It's very good. Uh, I'd like to introduce you now to Mr. Paddy Connolly, who's the CEO, and Ms. Sarah Lennon, who's the Training and Development Officer in Inclusion Ireland. Thank you. I just need to adjust these. They were set up for people with far greater height than I. Um, there must be something about this part of the, the day because I'm going to rely on a lot of pictures as well. Um, just to say, I suppose, when I was employed by Inclusion Ireland about 10 years ago, um, it was under a project called Who Decides and How. And that project um, aimed to raise awareness around what was called, I suppose, mental capacity at that stage, and many of the concerns being raised on, on that issue. And, and it quickly became very clear that who decides and how was exactly the question that people were asking. Um, the focus from families really at that point was when their son, daughter, sibling had questions over the decision-making ability, then who could make those decisions for them? Who could become a substitute decision-maker? And what form of guardianship was there? Often a phone call would start with, I'm calling about Sarah, she lacks capacity. And if I asked the person to do what, I was routinely met with confused silence. Over the decade or so that's passed, um, the thinking has shifted quite dramatically from mental capacity, and, and you'll see the journey on the, the slide behind me there. So reports such as the Lower Reform Commission's reports on the elderly and vulnerable adults and projects like Who Decides and How has begun a conversation away from status approaches and guardianship to where we are today. Um, in 2007, then, Ireland signed the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and you've heard about that already today. Um, the Minister for Justice at the time, Michael McDowell, described it as um, a, a blueprint for significant improvements in the lives of people with disabilities. We actually signed the UN Convention on the first day it was possible to sign it, and it remains to be ratified. We're in the last 7% um, of countries globe, globally who have signed and not ratified um, the Convention, so that's not particularly encouraging from that perspective. Um, in 2008, then, a bill was introduced by government called the Mental Capacity. Some of you will know that, Mental Capacity and Guardianship Bill. And although at that time, Inclusion Ireland welcomed it, and we said that it made some strides towards addressing the complex issue of legal capacity, we were really concerned that all it seemed to do was um, replace the, the wardship system. Well, in the end, we were, we were pretty glad that the 2008 bill did not become an act. We do have to acknowledge there was a human cost to that delay. Um, in that time, in those eight years, maybe up to 3,000 people became wards of court. And for many people, that was significantly detrimental to their lives. Um, to be really clear, Inclusion Ireland's position on ward of court has always been consistent. Um, we've always maintained that the Lunacy Act must be repealed with absolute urgency. We've, we've been calling it urgent for a decade. Um, we've seen through our advocacy work the, the misery, firsthand the misery and distress that it causes. Um, we've seen individuals forced into um, homeless services despite having maybe a quarter of a million euro in the bank, essentially. Um, we've seen individuals prevented from seeing other family members at the, you know, the whim of, of, of somebody else, even if they expressed a wish to see those family members. We've seen individuals denied the right to travel to see family members in case they didn't come back. Um, probably, maybe real, realistically, that they didn't come back. We've seen individuals denied the right to use their money to buy a home of their own, again, despite having significant funds. 
we've told that individuals could not purchase a winter coat, for example, because they'd purchased a winter coat last year. Um, we were told, individuals were told that they could never marry their partner, and if they were married, they could never divorce their partner. Um, we were told that um, you know, people were lunatics and people were angry at being legally labelled lunatics by the state. We're aware, um, and the Public Accounts Committee recently um, published a report on this, that a lot of people who were ward of court suffered significant losses to their fund um, during the period of the crash. And Inclusion Ireland is very concerned that over the period of time of discharge and people being removed from wardship, that some people may find that money that they may be inherited or were given as a, an award of damages um, may not be the same amount of money as they, as they were expecting it to be. We've seen adults becoming embroiled in, in custody arrangements as adults when there's a marriage separation. And overall, the ward of court system, we've seen secrecy, expense, red tape, and overall a lack of control. Most people never become a ward of court. Most people with intellectual disability or support needs simply don't have the assets to become a ward of court. And they're the people who are in the legal limbo. They're not legally entitled to support, but most often they want it or they need it. And instead, what we've seen is a swathe of informal systems cropping up. And informal supports are necessary, but informal decision-making is dangerous and informal decision-making can be inconsistent. Again, through our advocacy work, we've seen systems where financial institutions like banks or credit unions have required co-signatories or joint bank accounts, again, postponing the difficulty for another day. We've seen financial institutions requiring services to sign indemnities against loss or fraud. We've seen contracts for care or leases signed or co-signed by family. We've seen doctors, medical professionals, asking family members to sign consent forms, sometimes distant relatives who wouldn't really know the person particularly well. We've seen medical professionals refusing to act because of a perceived incapacity, leaving the person experiencing pain. Families are confused as to whether their son or daughter can inherit at all, and if they do, what the consequences of that could be for them. And individuals who want support to make decisions find that there is no support or there's no choice of support. Um, and I suppose one of the things that comes up quite consistently is there's confusion around, particularly people with intellectual disability, their rights to sexual relationships or marriage and founding a family. And that's not really particularly addressed by the current legislation, but it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing concern. So look, it's fair to say that people are excited and encouraged by the new law, particularly the people with support needs that we would talk to. Um, for many people, it offers an opportunity for greater autonomy. For others, the power to choose their support rather than have it foisted upon them. And for people who are awarded a court and their families, it could mean, it should mean, that they will regain control. On an international stage, in terms of the, 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 how the, the world sees Ireland, the biggest barrier to ratification of the CRPD, not all the barriers, but the biggest one, it's removed upon commencement, paving the way for ratification. And we can join the 93% of countries worldwide who have both signed and ratified that convention. But we have to acknowledge, too, that there is some fear around this new law, and people have articulated that to us, and there's confusion. And people are worried that individuals be left more vulnerable. There's always a risk. We all face risk every day, but there's a dignity to risk. And living a, a, a safe life is not to live a rich life. I think we owe it to the law, to individuals with support needs, to embrace the new law and make it work. A recent review of the Mental Capacity Act in the UK said their system was failing because social workers, healthcare professionals and others involved in the care of vulnerable adults are not aware of the Mental Capacity Act and they're failing to implement it. So we have an opportunity and indeed an onus on us not to let that happen in Ireland. People providing frontline services, be it social or health services, financial institutions, citizens' information, or even the likes of retail services, everyday services, need to signpost people towards the support structures. The only way the new system works is if it is used. And we embrace assisted decision making and make it commonplace. And it's encouraging to hear that consideration towards training and education is already en, en route. So um, in the video that follows, there's going to be a short video, we've asked several people to say in just one sentence how they felt about the act. So the video features people with support needs, intellectual disabilities, families and staff all saying what the act means to them. And I've forgotten the code word for the video, but let's give them a nod and hope that they, they know what I mean. Thank you.
recognise my rights to make my own decisions and then uh, when I want to make decisions I will choose the right person or the right candidate to help me, to support me in whatever uh, decision that I make. I'm really happy that this act has come into law because it could impact on any one of us in Irish society at any time if we have difficulty with our decisions during our life. The new law gives us the same equal rights as everyone else. To been the what's passed bill through the Roctus. And it was a good thing to go to the all stages. My thoughts on the enactment of the new bill, the new capacity bill, is that for people like my daughter, for over the last 100 years, she could have been called a, a lunatic. She's a young lady with an intellectual disability, and that has all changed now. It's good because I want to get a paid job. I want a paid job, you know. I've got no more money. And I'd like to get my own place as well, shared and paid a living. I got support when I needed it yeah, to move into a new apartment and I bought my own apartment. As a sister of somebody with an intellectual disability, this law will have a huge impact on our family. It means that my brother will be able to make his decisions his way and shape his future the way he wants to. I can get, I can crack my own DI now. Some people should have the right to make medical decisions for themselves with some support. Only support for some things, but not not all. And this is will support me if I if and when I need it. This act is important to me because if I ever have a child in the future who has an intellectual disability, it means that I can be sure that they can make their own choices. Everybody should be treated the same. Finally, this is a step forward to equality for all people in Ireland. Sometimes people don't know how to make choices because the right support isn't put in. I am really happy that now I can make I choose the support that I get. Nobody else can choose for me anymore. So I'm going to press. Right. So I'm going to speak very quickly because uh, we've only a few minutes. And I think somebody's holding up a card here telling, telling me that, that I've only a couple of minutes. minutes. I'd hate to be last, actually. <laughs> but um, the, the, the Act speaks to Article 12 of the, of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, which has been described as, as the beating heart of the Convention. And as people have said, it will clear the way uh, for, the, for, for the CRPD. It will be one of the things that clears the way for the CRB to be implemented. And, and the Department of Justice have set out an 18-month time frame for the implementation of the CRPD, which should bring us up to uh, the end of 2016. But what's important about the, uh, the CRPD is that it, it, plates, it places obligations on the state to monitor its implementation. Um, and, and that uh, it gives us some oversight or some way of monitoring the implementation of the ADM Act. You know, that, that there are obligations of the state to set up various independent ways uh, to monitor the ADM. And another issue that is, the little, is, is little known about is the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission Act 2014 provides for a public sector duty. And again, this places obligations on public bodies uh, in carrying out their functions to have regard to the need to, to eliminate discrimination, promote equality of opportunity and treatment of staff. So these kinds of mechanisms provide us with, with a way of, of ensuring the ADM hopefully is, is fully implemented. Um, and, and bodies like the HSE, as it says there, uh, have an obligation not just for people that they provide services to, but also for their employees to, to vindicate their rights and protect, uh, protect them against discrimination, etc. I'm going to skip through some of these things. So, 
for us, though, the issue is really around culture change, and many people have mentioned culture change here. Um, in a recent, uh, in a recent uh, document sent to the HSE uh, from Phelan Quinn, uh, the head of HICWA, in regard to services that they were inspecting, he said not many services were meeting basic human rights. Uh, interventions were inhumane and degrading treatment. Uh, there was institutionalized abuse and wholly in, in a, an inadequate response to allegations of abuse. So, from an Inclusion Ireland perspective, the whole issue of cultural change is, is the key change that needs to happen. But cultural change doesn't happen easy. It requires resources, it requires leadership, it requires investment, it requires time, uh, it requires specific actions. In a recent survey by the HSE of their staff, and I just put up some of the, uh, some of the outcomes from that survey, only 14% of HSE staff interviewed felt that they were valued in their work. Only 70% felt, uh, or 70 percent said they were not involved in the decisions um, about uh, their own work uh, and things that happen and impact them in the workplace. So from an inclusion point of view, there's a question around how that system then delivers decision-making supports and values persons with a disability in terms of the choices that they have to make. So when people talk about cultural shift and values, uh, we're talking about something seismic. And I'm often struck, because I talk to HSE staff every day, I'm off, and I was struck recently by the recent coverage of the Foster Home case and the PAC, and listening to HSE managers just talking at that. And the conversation was very clinical and, and very, uh, very managerial. And so people hearing this, and we hear this from families all the time, that the language of the institution is very, very clinical, that it's not, it isn't humane. So there's a real gap between you, and I know from working with, with most, from talking to HSE staff, most HSE staff have an innate desire to advocate. Um, and, and there's something about institutions that, that we lose that or we, or we, we push that out of people. Uh, and certainly in a lot of the centres where there's been very significant abuse, uh, I've talked to the staff in those centres, and the people I meet doesn't fit the picture of the HICWA reports, uh, doesn't fit, fit the comments of Phelan Quinn when he was talking to the Department of Health around abuse and that. So there's something missing. There's something, uh, there's, there's a gap between what, what HSE staff are committed to do, what you experience them doing, and yet uh, the outcomes from a lot of these institutional services. And that raises for us the question of culture uh, and the question of... of um, uh, values. There's a double up on the slides here, so I'm just going to go through it quickly. So, from an Inclusion Ireland point of view, we think there's an opportunity now, and Patricia Ricard Clark chairs the National Intersectoral Body on uh, Protecting Vulnerable Adults. I sit on the national task force that was established uh, after the, the scandal in Orsa Tracta. Uh, there's national summits being held. Uh, HICWA themselves are talking about developing a human rights uh, perspective in their own inspections. And I'm, I'm sure this speaks right across uh, sectors that you're all involved in. There is an, an opportunity for us to think about the culture of the organisation that we're working in and to develop what we would see as a values-based approach, where all of us as staff, um, and as people providing and receiving services, that we would all experience uh, a sense of being valued as individuals. Because until that happens within the HSC and in the public bodies who have a responsibility to deliver the ADM, uh, the, the, the Act, uh, we're not going to see the cultural and seismic shift that, that people are talking about. This Act has been called a paradigm shift, but that paradigm is not going to shift unless the people themselves who are working in services people who are, who are uh, delivering this, these changes on a daily basis, unless they themselves are seen as stakeholders who have rights uh, and are seen as stakeholders who are valued. So we've identified, and well, it's not us, uh, the Equality and Rights Alliance have identified a number of, of core values, and we're developing a project over the next year, and we hope to work with many people in the HSE, other services, mental health, older people, to develop a values-based approach uh, to understanding human rights and equality and implementing human rights and equality. The five values we've identified are autonomy, with its emphasis on choice, agency, self-determination and freedom. Democracy, with its emphasis on participation, voice and empowerment. 
dignity with its emphasis on respect, relationships, care and love, human worth. Inclusion with its emphasis on belonging, community, solidarity, the recognition of diversity, the practical implications of diversity. Social justice with its emphasis on access to and employment of health, of wealth, income, jobs, social goods, etc. So as I said, for us, the HSC and other bodies need to step into this space if we're to be serious about the, delivering this act, if we're to be serious about the cultural shift and the cultural change that we're talking about. And in my experience, talking to HSC staff all the time, there's something about validating that advocate that most of you have, that on a daily basis, people push things up into the system and get knocked back because of lack of resources um, or because the institutions, the needs of the institutions are too restrictive to actually advocate. We have to find some way of validating the advocate that I believe is in most uh, HSC staff, certainly in the people that I have met over the years. Um, and I think there's a, there's a responsibility on the bodies uh, like these and others, in, and I'm sure in your own sectors, uh, to start that process of developing something that we can all share. Um, and pushing that, that values-based approach. Um, and I think that uh, people are talking here about, about uh, cultural change and it's going to take a long time. And yes, language is important, and yes, practical actions are important. But actually, as I've said, unless we're all involved as stakeholders, unless we all see ourselves as equal stakeholders, then that change is not going to come about. Thanks very much. Thank you, thank you, Paddy and Sarah. Uh, our last speaker for, uh, between your, yourselves and lunch is Dr. David Robinson, consultant physician in geriatric medicine in St. James's Hospital. I'm the only thing standing between yourselves and lunch. <laughs> and there's 600 of you. <clears throat> my odds aren't good. Um, I don't know if you're going to learn anything concrete from my talk, but I just want to share with you my experiences as a, I'm listed as a consultant physician in geriatric medicine. We use that term unapologetically because we're the geriatrics. We're, it's the doctors that are geriatric and the medicine, not the patients. They're older patients. And I suppose two things I want to talk about really are my frustrations with the older system and how I see that how these changes with the Assisted Decision Making Act may um, positively impact on that and also the way we change our practice in particular around um, capacity, uh, capacity assessment, which has become the bane of my life over the last few years as, um, as awareness has increased. The reason I think the older patient population or the older population in general are particularly important to this, it's probably going to represent the largest single group of people um, uh, that are affected by, that will be affected by the Assisted Decision Making Act. And Older people, bring, older people are different in many ways because they bring a complexity. Every older person comes with a history. I often think it's ironic that I'm providing advice to people who are often twice my age. What I say to them is, well, look, you're 85. You've never been 85 before, and they all agree with that. And I say, well, I've met more 85-year-olds than you have, probably, because that's all I do. It's my, it's my job, um, uh, which is true. But older people bring a complexity. They bring wisdom. Often they know their own situations better than we do. Um, and that's important when we're trying to provide advice. They have social support, so they don't, and they have financial resources, or so they don't, and they vary. There's a lot more um, difference between a room full of 80-year-olds than it would be with a room full of 20-year-olds. Prof. Neil says we're born copies, but we die originals. Um, so I've thrown this slide in. It's good to see we're all coming off the same hymn page in many ways, but when we're talking about decision-making, we're, we're talking about power, a power over ourselves, and autonomy is highly valued in Western societies and has been since before the um, uh, Lunacy Act. Um, John Stuart Mill, Mill wrote, the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant. And we do things to people, older people, for their own good all the time, just because they've lost capacity. And if you take a rights-based approach to it, when we commit, I'm going to use that, when we commit a person to a nursing home, we effectively deprive them of their liberty. And now with the fair deal, we also deprive, restrict their access to property or deprive them. So it's two fundamental rights that you're interfering with when you put somebody into a nursing home. And you can do that without their consent. You can do that without them physically present. Uh, you can do that on the hearsay of family who say that they're not managing at home, or in some situations, just families who are, just can't deal with worrying about them. I've had situations where 
family members who are not carers come to me saying they can't take it anymore. And I say, well, what exactly do you do for your mother or father? Oh, I worry. Um, I've had fat patients flown into me from other countries for me to sign off on them going into nursing homes, um, sometimes with their knowledge and consent, other times not. Um, so, yeah, I suppose the point is that uh, uh, it's a lot of power that we're talking about here, and it may affect all of us in the future. Um, We've talked about the lunacy regulation. We've all said the same thing, I think, but I can add one thing to that. Not only, that's very small, but not only can you be a lunatic in Irish law un until this year, you can also be an alleged lunatic, in which case you'll be treated as if you are a lunatic. Um, <laughs> and it, it is literally Victorian. It, she wasn't quite Empress of India when, when the act was created, but she was in her 34th year, I just checked that, of her reign. And Bismarck was the, had become the first chancellor of the newly created Germany. It's about as old as Germany, um, the law with which we're dealing with. I'm going to talk about a few individual cases, and I'm going to be circumspect to the point of opacity um, to respect their confidentiality. But in this first instance, actually, this person had no relatives. We'll call her Judith, because that's my mother's name. Um, she was admitted to St. James's Hospital a number of years ago, and we knew within a week of her being admitted that she needed to go to a nursing home. Um, we knew because she'd been admitted two years previously, and it had been documented in the notes around that time that she was struggling in the community. Her husband had already been placed in a nursing home before the fair deal had come into place, so he was entitled to a nursing home bed at that stage, and he moved into it. Um, she had no family whatsoever. Um, she was a little bit paranoid. She did have a dementia, um, and she, didn't, she trusted us to the extent that she told us that she had a deceased sister-in-law in the UK and had a surname, but that was it. That was all we had. Um, she lived across the road from her GP, but uh, her GP didn't know her, hadn't seen her in some time. And the guards weren't of any help to us either, unfortunately. Um, so it took us a while to establish all of that, and then a while to um, persuade the hospital to apply for ward of court proceedings, because there's nobody else to do so. And then it took um, 569 days. She was an inpatient. I should add that her husband was still in a nursing home, and I phoned the nursing home and you know, tried to arrange for her to go there, but there was nobody to pay for her bed. Um, we used to get a health care assistant to bring her over, because there was nobody else to do that either, at intervals. Um, unfortunately, uh, he died, uh, and we placed her in a different nursing home, so they never got to be together. Um, uh, and that was the fault of our system. Um, this lady, um, we'll call her Anne, and again, just to fudge the details, was admitted to hospital with an acute medical condition. Um, within a week or two, there was a solicitor at the bed trying to um, get her to make a will, which is fair enough. I mean, older people have the right to make wills, but there was doubts around this lady's capacity. Um, when it, she had a significant amount of property, and when it came to uh, an, a long decision around going into a nursing home, two separate parties um, uh, applied to be a committee uh, for the ward of court and opposed each other. And again, all this was done in, in uh, the patient's absence. Uh, and in the end, one side was favoured to be the committee, and the costs of that legal proceeding was taken out of A's, um, uh, A's uh, finances. And she went to a nursing home. And, and she was in hospital for 308 days while we, uh, while we sorted that out. And lastly, we'll call this person David, because that's my name. Um, this is just a routine case that, that has taken this length of time um, in order to process, um, uh, just because the old system is, is so slow. Um, I need to credit um, Dara Bergen for the clinical work, because these patients are cohorted um, in our social work department, and one person deals with them. But I need to stress that these figures are anecdotal. Um, so these are back of the envelope um, uh, calculations, which aren't. Um, official figures from James's Hospital, but we would have between eight and ten. I have at any one time um, perhaps ten people on my list waiting for long-term care, of whom one or two might be uh, uh, applying to be made a ward of course. So on average, we'd have eight to ten across the hospital, but they take 18 months to process, which works out of the, the maths of 3,285 bed days. Now, the average admission in our hospital lasts about seven days. So that's the equivalent of 470 medical admissions just taken up with this. And none of these people need to be in hospital. That's the whole, that's the whole point. And it would cost, in terms of bed days, it costs about three million euro um, per annum. So in terms of how is it going to change, um, well, capacity assessment, as you know, the old act acts off status. Dr. Robinson doesn't have capacity because he has Alzheimer's, because he has Alzheimer's disease. But we're going to move to the functional approach that um, Siobhan mentioned earlier, and it's going to be individual, individual decision specific. And that's going to be a huge challenge, particularly with the cultural shift that, that we hope or expect to change. Um, these are the commonest things that I'm asked to um, decide on, capacity to decide on going home, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Create an enduring power of attorney, ability to create a will, a capacity to engage in fair deal, which now equates to financial capacity. And it's one of the constraints that we have in hospital, whereby a patient might agree that, yes, they 
they need to go into a nursing home. They've come to that stage of their life. They don't object strongly, but they have no idea what their finances are. Their, 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 capa their mental capacities have slipped such to the stage that they can't engage in that. So they lack financial capacity. And then you're in a quandary where, um, uh, particularly if there's signif significant property involved, where the patient still needs to be made a ward of court. Um, or capacity to refuse treatment is something that uh, uh, I'm not asked to do that often. But in terms of capacity to decide on going home, this is going to be the real cultural shift because um, Mervyn mentioned it earlier, how most of us want to die in our own homes and most of us are going to die, let's face it. Uh, we, make, we make decisions, at, the, at present, we make decisions in the best interest of people. My concern as a, as a physician in, in this area is that capacity is used as a weapon to override people's wishes. What I, say, I get referrals from other teams or you hear from allied health professionals saying the person wants to go home, but they lack capacity. So it doesn't mean they can't go home. It means it's harder. Um, it means we have to provide for that, that there may be a risk which the person doesn't understand, but there seems to be a reluctance on the part of anybody else to take on that risk. Um, instead, the option is to put them into a nursing home. If you put somebody into a nursing home against their will, their 12-month mortality is 30%. So you're not doing them any favours by, by actually putting them into a situation which is safer for you, or less stressful for you, but more dangerous for the individual. Um, and I think what, what the cultural shift that we'll take is, uh, uh, is for us to, to assume some of that risk on behalf of a person who no longer is able to. I had one phone call with, I rate phone call with family members who said that um, they told me that if their sister who had a mild dementia was sent home that they would be responsible and they got legal advice on that. I said, that's terrible legal advice. Who told you that? And they weren't able to tell me, but they, they had a set of keys which belonged to the patient and they, were, they wouldn't surrender the keys um, uh, as, as, uh, as it was their only mechanism of, of, of preventing the person from going home. And I accused them of theft and then I got the keys and um, that person went home and has been fine since. The amount, um, but if we move from a best interest model, which, we, which we're all guilty of now, towards patient preference, that's going to involve a massive cultural shift in terms of families accepting that their loved one is at home. Um, uh, we want autonomy for ourselves and safety for others. And us as professionals, we're going to have to take some risky um, decisions, or what might be perceived to be risky decisions, which we know are um, uh, compliant with the values of our patients. So I'll just leave you with one last thought. Um, this, uh, anybody who's interested in this, and this is going to be, in, in terms of hospital discharge, it's going to be much more common. Autonomy versus welfare, anatomy of a risky discharge by Sean O'Keefe in the Irish Medical Journal from 2001 discusses some of these points. Um, how Sean discharged a patient in accordance with their wishes home um, with a whole range, neighbours were coming in from, from, uh, from randomly um, to try and stop that discharge. But I think it's important for us to remember that in Irish law, everybody has capacity until shown otherwise. Thanks. Sir. Thank you very much, David. Very good set of presentations. All the speakers will be here for the 50 minute question and answer session in the afternoon. In order that you all get lunch, I think we should go to lunch. Uh, just to conclude this session, to say I think we all now understand the implications uh, of how we, you know, the change in culture and practice that this represents for us. I think we have to all become catalysts and activists for this act, and I hope uh, I commend that to you all. And I would like to just remind you that orlab.oreilly at hse.ie will receive any questions that are not answered at this, uh, at this conference. Thank you all very much.